of Acts, and tonight we are in Acts chapter 28, verses 7 through 10. Miracles and Money, part 7. One of the things that is a great bane of our time is the way in which there are charlatans out there trying to get you to pay them for doing pseudo-miracles, or in some cases, demonic miracles, uh, and then telling everybody that if they give money, then for sure they'll get all kinds of blessings. We're in Acts chapter 28, beginning in verse 6. Albeit when they looked when he should have swollen or fallen down dead suddenly, but after they had looked a great while and saw no harm come to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a god. In the same quarters were possessions of the chief man of the island, whose name was Publius, who received us and lodged us three days courteously. And it came to pass that the father of Publius lay sick of a fever and of a bloody flux, to whom Paul entered in and prayed and laid his hands on him and healed him. So when this was done, others also, which had diseases in the island, came and were healed, who also honored us with many honors. And when we departed, they laded us with such things as were necessary. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we pray for your blessings on your word tonight, that it will not return void, but that it will accomplish that which you please and prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. We pray, Father, that you might give us encouragement from the Word of God to know that you are the God who always meets our needs. We don't have to resort to trickery. We don't have to resort to odd ways of getting money. We know that your Word declares certain things specifically that we must do. And we pray, Father, for your blessings on it tonight, that we might understand it and apply it to our lives. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, tonight we're talking about part seven, miracles and money, and to remember our basic premises in the six or seven part study so far, the key to riches is this, it's not what you own, but how you view what you own. I hope you all remember that. A rich man can be covetous and he can be content. A poor man can be covetous or he can be content. Some rich people are content, some poor people are deadly covetous, and covetousness is idolatry. Paul says so in Colossians 3.5 and Ephesians 5.5, 5, and he tells us that the covetous man is an idolater. God doesn't condemn people for being rich. God gave it to them. It's God who gives you the power to get wealth. The Bible says that specifically in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 18. But God also is the one who withholds wealth from us, and he does it for two reasons. Can you remember? This is review. Who can remember the two reasons that God often withholds money from us? Okay, number one is to prove us or test us where our heart lies. Because a poor man can love money just as much as a rich man. So sometimes God withholds it to see whether or not we're going to trust him or if we're going to be running after the mighty dollar. What's the second reason? The first is to test us whether we love God or love money. The second reason that God withholds money is... Oh, come on, come on. To do us good at the end if we respond properly to the test of money. It's God who is the one who's in control. We have to learn to trust him, not learning to trust money. Not thinking there are some kind of magic ways to get money. Now, the summary of what we've learned so far, because money, uh, and the next, by the way, there in Deuteronomy 18, the very next thing that it talks about is false gods. And of course, the love of money is one of the false gods of our time in the United States of America. So what we've learned so far, having money as a stewardship from by, by God, we use it wisely or one of two things will happen. What are the two things that happen if we don't use money wisely that God has given us? He can take it away or take away our ability to enjoy it. And I gave you a lot of illustrations about that. That brought us to the twofold key of, uh, to biblical wealth management, which is, do you remember the twofold key to biblical wealth management? You have to view yourself as a steward. a steward. You're not an owner. You have to view yourself as a steward who must give an account for what is given to you. And number two, if you really are a steward, it means it's not yours, then the second thing will take place, which is you're willing to let it go if God decides to take it. And you don't get all anxiety about it. You're a steward. You try to manage God's money wisely and he has told you the areas, the categories in which to manage that money and your responsibilities for it before him because as a steward, you will give an account. And Jesus gave that very clearly in a number of his parables. The stewards always have to give an account for what is put into their hands. So a lot of times I think to myself, man, I'm sure glad I don't have a lot of money because you know I don't know very much about 
money, you know. I mean, people out there in the world, they know how to trade it and do all this kind of stuff, and I don't know any of that stuff. I just try to use it in the categories where God has said to use it, and there's always enough, always enough to accomplish what he wants. So topics we've covered so far. We've looked at many illustrations from the Bible that told us about people who failed to have the divine perspective on money. We looked at the fakes, the charlatans, the apostates, and the heretics who all fall into that category. Second, we looked at Proverbs 37 through 9 and saw that the key attitude toward money is contentment with what we have. Paul articulates that principle of contentment, of course, in many passages in the New Testament. Third, we looked at the principal passages where Paul warned Timothy about money and apostates. That was 1 Timothy chapter 6. Fourth, we studied the principal passage where Peter warned about money and apostates in 2 Peter 2, 1 through 3. Fifth, we saw how both Paul and Peter give a second reason for preaching apostasy, which is immoral sex, and that's 2 Timothy 3, verses 1 through 7. We saw that Peter gave us three illustrations that show the character of the apostates who are greedy for money over in 2 Peter 2, verses 4 through 22, and the three illustrations where the angels have followed Satan in his fall, that's the lust for power. We saw, two, the day, world in the days of Noah, that's rejection of the true God, and three, Sodom is given by Peter as an illustration of the apostates, the lust for perverted sex from the divine standard for marriage. Number six, Jude wrote his entire epistle. You remember that, I hope. We went through that very briefly. That's called flying high over Jude. Uh, the entire epistle shows the character of the apostates and mentions both their greed for money and their wicked lust for sex. That's verses 3 through 25, a very short book, only one chapter long. So, in other words, the issue of apostasy, greed, and immoral sex is a very huge topic in the New Testament, well, in the Bible for that matter, because covetousness is idolatry, and that's one of the things that's built into the heart of man because of his old sin nature. And God judges and kills idol worshipers. So if you're covetous, if you're an idolater, the Bible is full of illustrations about God killing and judging idolaters among his people. There are all kinds of pagans out there, and they're going to get judged someday. But God hates it when his people are filled with idolatry, and covetousness is idolatry. We saw that in the Old Testament illustrations. Jesus gave an illustration of that principle in the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24. We saw an illustration, that particular illustration was included in all three of the Synoptic Gospels. Two weeks ago, we saw how God gives us restrictions when that's designed to keep us from focusing on one of our sins of character weakness. The love of money is a sin of character weakness. And God can give you a restriction, and he often does, to keep you from focusing on a sin of character weakness. Like we might love money too much. But you know, that applies to any sin. Whatever your pet sin is, God can give you a a restriction. Paul had a character weakness, which he admits, and we talked about that. He enjoyed being the center of attention, and his weakness was that he might think too much of himself if God didn't do something about it, because he got all that special revelation. In Paul's case, he called it a thorn in the flesh. And sometimes God gives us a thorn in the flesh, that is a point of suffering, to refine our character and to keep us from that particular sin. Now, in Paul's case, God used a demonic uh, agent to do that. God can use Satan or a demonic entity to slow down your character weakness so that it doesn't enhance your sin. As a balance, though, God always gives you the ability, through the power of the Holy Spirit, to deal with the thorn in a way that is for your good and for his glory. So, as Paul did in our passage here, which we've been looking at, when you find yourself among barbarians and the cold and you've gotten snake bitten like Paul was and had to shake it off in the fire, remember God is refining you as pure gold tried in the fire. Job 23, 10, But he knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Paul talks about his weakness, which he freely admits over in 2 Corinthians 12, 7. And lest I should be exalted above measure, through the abundance of the revelations, there was given unto me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me, that's to beat me up, lest I should be exalted above measure. You know, when God sends you a thorn in the flesh, it's for your good. It's something you should praise him for. Because it means God is graciously keeping you from a weakness and from a sin that otherwise you'd be involved in. In fact, Paul says it twice there in that passage, lest I should be exalted above measure. So we know Paul honestly understood that the special revelation that God gave unto him could have made him proud. And unless we are honest with ourselves about our own character weaknesses, we will never have victory over them. There may even be a point where God has to give us a thorn in the flesh to help remind us from time to time, don't do it again. 
Now, I think I pointed out last week that we were talking here two weeks ago that it was a thorn in the flesh. Last week, Brother Keith Coleman from the Independent Board for Presbyterian Foreign Missions was with you all. But two weeks ago, I think I pointed out it was a thorn in the flesh. In other words, it was a physical restriction. It was in the flesh that related to his body. Did you know God can slow your body down? Now, those of us who are getting older know that that's happening already. God is slowing our bodies down. But when you're young, God can slow your body down too. You think you're good and strong and healthy, but there's a particular weakness that God wants to keep you from sinning against him. He can give you a thorn in the flesh where suddenly you have a weakness there that you never thought was possible. You see, we express what's going on in our spirit through our body. So to restrict our body, God has lots of different options. He can do anything from giving you paralysis to throwing you in jail to restricting you from using your body in a way that brings shame to him when he has a job which he wants you to get done. That brought us back to full circle where we studied your body as the temple of the Holy Spirit. God commands you to treat it properly with moral purity, with care, and we don't have to guess what that means. Uh, there are specific areas in which you must protect your body which is a temple. Most of those relate to moral purity, not merely to physical exercise. And we looked at the physical exercise in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8. Physical exercise profits a little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. In other words, physical exercise profits in this life, but godliness profits you both in this life and in eternity. Paul frequently used the illustration of physical exercise to describe the Christian life. For example, over in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24 and following, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that ye may obtain. Hey, that's, that's something to look forward to. Most people don't understand the concept of heavenly rewards. They don't understand the concept that if you run hard in the race and you win your race, you get a gold medal. And I ran lots of races, and so I understand this. I loved these passages, especially when I was in high school. I read them over and over and over and over again, often before I had to go into a race. Every man that strives for the mastery is temperate and is self-controlled. You know, the athletes who win are not the ones who go out and booze and party till 3 o'clock in the morning right before they have to run a race at 8 o'clock in the morning. They don't do it. They're self-controlled. They understand what is necessary if they want to win their race. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, I'm not just staggering around the track wondering which way to go, so fight I not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. <clears throat> you know, God can decide to put you on the shelf. He can decide to put me on the shelf. He can say, Christian Spencer, you're done. I'm sick of your sin in this area. I'm sick of your sin in that area. I'm sick of your sin in that area. I'm putting you on the shelf. I'm going to can you. You're not going to preach anymore. He can do that. Paul recognized it was possible even for him. Lest when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. And then we looked at a lot of other passages in the New Testament that teach the principle of the body temple, our responsibility for keeping it morally and spiritually pure. We looked at 1 Corinthians 3, 1 Corinthians 6, 2 Corinthians 6, Ephesians chapter 2. And finally, we contrasted God's normal method for getting money with the charlatan method for getting money. The first thing that we looked at, and this was what we studied last time, God always meets the needs of his own children and those around them, they get blessed as well. And we saw that here in our passage where Paul is doing the miracles, but the whole shipwreck, uh, shipload of people who got wrecked got blessed by all the things that the people on the island were bringing because Paul was the one who was doing the miracles. It wasn't just Paul getting rich. The entire group had all their needs met. They didn't all get rich, but they had all their needs met. God meets the needs of his children in various ways. In contrast to the apostates who want money for miracles, we started looking at the two ways that God normally meets the needs of his children, and they're self-evident, obviously. But you need to know the references when you run into the charismatic types. First, other Christians who have the right perspective on money, that is, Christians that know they are stewards and not owners of the personal resources that God has trusted to them, those are people who give to the needs of other believers who have genuine needs, not phony needs. I've dealt with a lot of phony needs. I used to work as the attorney for Christian Service Mission in uh, Birmingham, Alabama. We provided food for over 100 different ministries in the Birmingham area. And we were always having people coming down to us and begging for money or begging for this or other things. And uh, we had a really sharp lady, uh, a black lady, uh, name of Mar Rhonda Marshall. Uh, I mean, 
she could see through these people like <laughs> nobody's business. I mean, you know, she knew who was real and she knew who was phony. I mean, she could tell within 30 seconds of talking to him who was real and who was phony. I mean, she'd been doing this for so many years. And, uh, you know, I got to where I was pretty good at it, but certainly not as good as Rhonda was. Um, you know, there are those out there, and I've had them show up many times at different churches where I've served. I can remember back in San Antonio, our church was right on uh, the, the loop around the city. And uh, these folks would always show up at the end of the service. They wouldn't show up at the beginning of the service. They'd show up at the end of the service. They'd drive up. They'd pull into the parking lot and wait for everybody to come out. And then <clears throat> usually the uh, uh, man would send his wife with some crying baby up to the door to beg for money from people coming out of the church door. And uh, I would, always, they'd, of course, direct him to me. And I'd say, well, where's your husband? She'd say, well, he's in the car. I'd say, well, I'll talk to your husband. They'd, he'd husband come out. And we always had work projects to do around that church. It was a large piece of property, about seven and a half acres, and uh, needed a lot of bush hogging and uh, things like that. And, um, so I'd say, well, look, uh, we'll be happy to pay you minimum wage. Um, we need this done, or we need this done. You know, I never had one guy, not one, in the entire time that I was there, my dad founded that church, and so we were there for a long time, never had one who was willing to work for the money. They always had some other excuse. Well, we need the money so we can get, buy gas, so that we can get on around the loop. I discovered later that several of those folks, didn't follow up on all of them, but several of them hit two or three churches on a Sunday. They would find out what times churches started. Some start earlier than others. And, and then they would go from church to church, and some of them were getting out of there with five, $600 on a Sunday and not doing one stitch of work. And then they'd make their way on to someplace else. We're going to talk about work tonight in just a few minutes. But the way God meets his, the needs of his own children first is other Christians who have a right perspective on money and who help meet the needs of needy believers. And, of course, the second is diligent personal work. That sacrificial sharing with other believers is the first method, uh, and most of us don't like the concept of sacrificial sharing, so it's good to be reminded of it, not just giving them a tip, but sacrificial sharing, and we see many times of that in the New Testament. Uh, we talked about the widow who gave her two mites. Jesus said that she gave more than all the rest of the rich people who were throwing in hundreds of shekels into the offering box because they gave out of their abundance, but she gave everything that she had. And that principle is not just in the Gospels, it's squarely in the doctrinal epistles after Pentecost as well. Pentecost has been called the birthday of the church, and so that's clearly not the Old Testament principle of tithing. And the tithing uh, in the Old Testament was 10% the first year, 20% the second year, 30% the third year, which is called in the Old Testament is called the year of tithing. You're not kidding. That averages out to 20%. And that cycle went through twice, and then you'd hit the seventh year where the fields had to lie fallow, and you couldn't get any income at all. So it sort of was an enforced savings plan. So you not only had to give an average over a six-year period of 20%, but then you had to have saved enough so it could help you through the seventh year. You didn't uh, get to plow your fields during the seventh year. That's a little different than most people teach in relation to tithing. <clears throat> that was an enforced savings plan. In the New Testament, the emphasis is not on the tithe, which was required by the law, but on giving freely out of a heart filled with love for God and for the brethren. In other words, grace. Grace is different than law. Grace always goes farther than the law ever requires. Grace comes as a result of love. It comes out of a heart that is not focused on self, but it's a heart that's focused on God and focused on others with genuine needs. Sacrificial giving, principle number one. And we, we looked at 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through 10, and Christ, of course, himself there is the illustration of sacrificial giving. And we saw how often the giving that Paul talks about in that chapter is related to grace. The word grace is mentioned over and over and over and over again in that passage. And we saw that's the principal passive principle of what goes around comes around known as the law of harvest. We looked at the law of harvest in the book of Galatians and uh, Paul reminded them of the wilderness wanderings, how God provided for them in spite of the fact that they weren't worthy of, I mean you think of all the times they rebelled ten times in the wilderness. They, God put up with them for 40 years in the wilderness and yet he provided manna for them every day, and it didn't stop until they crossed the Jordan River and ate the crops of the land. That's incredible grace that God provided. We've been talking about doing everything to the glory of God, and one of the ways that God provides for us when there are times of need is with other believers, and when we as believers who have resources make God our God and not money our God. Now tonight, 
That brings us to principle number two. That was a complete summary of the last six weeks. Principle number two, the usual method that God uses of meeting the needs of Christians is work. Now, I got seven different divisions of this. I'm going to try to move through that in the next uh, 25 minutes if I can. But the first thing that we need to see, and I was astounded when I actually began this study, I was astounded at how many places this happens to show up in the New Testament. You know, uh, there would have been people that were complaining about Paul and Barnabas uh, going around and preaching, getting, getting an offering for doing their preaching. But Paul establishes the fact that full-time Christian ministry is a category of genuine work for which a man should be paid. Spiritual work should get paid with money. He says that here. We'll see it in the second and first Corinthians 9 11. Although sometimes a man in full-time Christian ministry may choose, as Paul did, to forego getting paid. So I'm going to read this to you in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, if you have your Bibles, because Paul spends an entire chapter on this. That those involved in full-time Christian ministry are doing genuine work for which they should be paid. Am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are not ye my work in the Lord? So we have the word work first shows up. Now, he's going to talk about that in detail a little bit later on, but he introduces the, the idea in verse 1. If I be not an apostle unto others, yet doubtless I am unto you. For the seal of mine apostleship are ye in the Lord. He started the church there. He led those people all to Christ. Mine answer to them that do examine me is this. Some people were complaining, saying, why in the world do we give Paul anything? Have we not power to eat and drink? Have we not power to lead about, and that's exousia, that means authority, to lead about a sister, a wife, as well as other apostles, and as the brethren of the Lord and Cephas? Or as all of Jesus' brothers were married, and so was Peter. Or I only and Barnabas, have we not power to forbear working? Now, in other words, this is our authority, exousia. It's not dunamis, that's the word for boom, boom kind of power, but the word for authority kind of power. You mean only I and Barnabas, we're the only ones who don't have to get paid for the work we do? And then he asks the question, who goeth a warfare any time at his own charges? I mean, does a soldier have to pay his own way so he can fight the war? Who plants a vineyard and eateth not the fruit thereof? Who feeds a flock and eateth not of the milk of the flock? Say I these things as a man, or saith not the law the same thing also? In other words, this is a transdispensational principle. This is true in the New Testament, but it was also true in the Old Testament as well. That's why God provided for the priests. The priests got to eat of the sacrifices that were brought for the worship of God. Is it not written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not mu muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn? In other words, you can't keep the ox from eating while he's doing the work. Doth God take care for oxen? Or saith he it altogether for our sakes? So here's your choice. God's only caring about oxen, or God cares about people too. And that's why he wrote this. For our sakes, no doubt, this is written, that he that ploweth should plow in hope, and that he that thresheth in hope should be partaker of his hope. Now, here's verse 11. This is what I was talking about a few minutes ago. <clears throat> if we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing, or we would say in modern vernacular, is it a big deal if we shall reap your carnal things? In other words, there's a man who is giving you something that you can't see. <laughs> spiritual things. Paul's teaching the Word of God. He's teaching them things about eternity. He's teaching them things about how to live a life that's pleasing to God. And he said, you know, you ought to be paying me for that. Is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? If others be par uh, partakers of this power over you, are not we rather? In other words, there were others who were getting paid for what they were doing in this. Why were the Corinthians, you know, resistant to the idea of paying Paul? Nevertheless, we have not used this power. Paul says, I could have exercised it. I could have told you, you got to do it. Do it now. He said, I chose not to do that because, of course, Corinth was a carnal church. That's the whole point of 1 Corinthians. The first nine verses, he commends them. He praises them in chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. The entire rest of the epistle, he's bawling them out for false doctrine and false practices. He's bawling them out for their wickedness, for their carnality, for how they're not living the Christian life like they should be living the Christian life. They're even messing up the, the concept of the resurrection when you get over to chapter 15. That was a carnal church. Nevertheless, we have not used this power, but suffer all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. Paul says, 
I'm, not, I'm willing not to take any money at all because I don't want to cause a stumbling block to the gospel of Christ. I want people to focus on that and not on how much are we paying the preacher. Do you not know that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple? And they which wait at the altar are partakers of the altar. That's what he said a little earlier. Said not the law of the same thing also. He expands on it here a little. Even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. So Paul's establishing the fact that full-time Christian ministry is a category of genuine work in the eyes of God for which a man should be paid. But I have used none of these things, neither have I written these things that it should be so done unto me. You know, but I suppose that every preacher for the last 2,000 years has been thankful that Paul did write them, even though that Paul wasn't writing it for his own benefit. For it were better for me to die that any man should make my glorying void. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me, yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. That's really true of all those who have been gifted with the gift of pastor, teacher, or the gift of evangelist, or the gift of teacher. Those are the gifts that are the leadership gifts in the New Testament church. For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed to me, I still have to give an account for it, whether I like it or not. What is my reward then? Verily, when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge that I abuse not my power in the gospel. So Paul says, you know, for the most part, I just don't take a salary. For the most part, I just say, hey, God will provide for me some other way. You guys don't want to do it? That's fine. You'll have to give account for that someday. For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. Under the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without law, as without law, being not without law to God, but under the law of Christ. Notice he says, I don't live a libertine kind of a life, but I try to identify with each group that I'm trying to reach. I get all the, the garbage out of the way so that I can present Jesus Christ to them. To the weak I became as weak, that I might gain the weak. I made all things unto all men, that I might by all means ha save some. And this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker thereof with you. And that's where he gets into the idea of eternal, heavenly rewards. Because, you know, a man who's faithful down here below, whether he gets money for it or not, you think about the, the missionaries in North Korea right now some of whom have been caught and are in jail, one of whom I read about within the last two weeks, uh, who was a, in South Korea, um, but he, he had a church very close to the border. And um, many times people who would defect and come across the border would come to his church for help, and he gave them help. And he was tricked into going out one night to help someone whom he trusted. And he was taken and assassinated and his body left by the road. Within the, last, within the last month this happened. You know something? He has a really big paycheck coming. He's got some heavenly rewards. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receives the prize, so run that you may obtain. I read these verses for a minute ago. Every man that strives for the mastery is tempered in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we and incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest the binding means when I preach to others, I myself should be a castaway. Now Paul has spent a whole chapter on that idea. But did you know that in multiple books in the New Testament, spiritual ministry is called work? And the same word is used for spiritual ministry work as is used for manual labor? The same word, where spiritual ministry is called work, that's the same word for work as manual labor. Let me just give you a few of these out of many different books in the New Testament. Acts 13, 2. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. Chapter 14. And thence sailed to Antioch, from whence they had been recommended to the grace of God for the work which they fulfilled. This is spiritual ministry that's going on here. These are missionaries. Acts 15, chapter, uh, chapter 15, verse 38. But Paul thought it not good to take him with them, that is, John Mark, who departed from them, from Pamphylia, and went not with them to the work. Yeah. 
chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 1. Am I not apostle? We just read this. Am I not free? Have I not seen the Lord Jesus Christ our Lord? Are you not my work in the Lord? Chapter 15, 1 Corinthians, the great resurrection passage. Verse 58, therefore, my brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. The spiritual ministry is seen as work. That's the word that's used. For as much as you know that your labor, that's another word dealing with work, is not in vain in the Lord. 1 Corinthians 16, 10. Now if Timotheus come, see that he may be with you without fear, for he worketh the work of the Lord as I also do. Timothy wasn't an apostle, he was just a young guy, but he was doing the work of the Lord like Paul. Philippians chapter 2, verse 30. Because for the work of Christ he was nigh unto death, not regarding his life, to supply your lack of service toward me. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 13, and to esteem them very highly in love, speaking about the, the leadership, highly in love for their work's sake, and be at peace among yourselves. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, this is a true saying, if any man desire the office of a bishop, that's a, an overseer, bishops and elders are the same thing, but different aspects of the same work, uh, he desireth a good work. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 21. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. God uses clean vessels. 2 Timothy 4, chapter, uh, chapter 4, verse 5. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of thy ministry. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 10. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love which you have showed toward his name and that you have ministered to the saints and do minister hebrews chapter 13 verse 21 make you perfect in every good work to do his will working in you that which is well pleasing in his sight through jesus christ to him be glory forever and ever amen so you get the idea <clears throat> new testament all over the new testament spiritual ministry is clearly called work with the same word that is used for manual labor Secondly, Paul establishes that full-time Christian pastoral ministry should be paid, now you're not going to like this, but this is what the Bible says, should be paid twice as much as those who are getting paid for temporal labor in the church. Now the charismatics have run away with that one, but we might call that twice the annual average income of the members of the church, but Paul says that over in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 17 and 18. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, and the word translated honor there is remuneration, double remuneration, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. And the word especially is the word malista. It means it's what we would use as a defining word. By that I mean to say those who labor, there's another word for working, isn't it? In the word and doctrine. Now, you know, most of the times that you go to a and those of you who've been with us on Wednesday evening have seen this, where we've got, you know, hours of video footage of different charismatic revivals and stuff. The guys are not up there teaching doctrine. They're not up there teaching the Bible. They're up there doing their, you know, show. And uh, everybody's running around and falling down and, you know, jumping up and down and uh, pounding on the floor and falling over backwards, getting slain in the spirit, and people are covering them with robes and stuff like that. And we, we've seen, you know, dozens of different ones of these very famous charismatic preachers on Wednesday evenings uh, through the videos. Uh, what does it say here? A of they who labor in the word and doctrine. That's not what those guys are doing. For the scripture says, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. He's quoting Deuteronomy in the first half of that, and he's quoting Luke in the second half of that, which, by the way, is one of the indications that the Apostle Paul holds on an equal level the inspiration both of the Old Testament and of the Gospel writers. And Peter does the same thing. He quotes the Old Testament and he says, As also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things. So Peter sees the writings of Paul as inspired. Paul is seeing the writings of Luke as inspired. You see a cross-reference all the way through the scriptures like this, where the inspiration of scripture is supported by other portions of scripture for the the prophecies of the Old Testament, for the history of the Old Testament, for the Gospels, for the doctrinal epistles between different writers of the, of the doctrinal epistles. You see parallels, for example, between Jude and Second Peter uh, along that line. Number three, 
and this is where it gets the rubber meets the road for all of us God expects every Christian to work particularly the men to produce an income for four different purposes men are supposed to work to produce an income for four different purposes number one to support his own family number two to support other needy Christians number three to support the pastor number four to support the ministry and outreach of the church corporately those are the purposes that God says a man should work for we're gonna look at the verses here in just a second those are your four purposes I hope you were able to list them number one supporting your own family number two supporting the other needy Christians number three supporting the pastor number four supporting the ministry and the outreach of the church corporately where we come together and we do special things for ministry outreach like missions now let's look at the examples number one Jesus himself set the example John chapter 4 verse 34 Jesus saith unto them my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work same word for work Jesus says I'm going to do God's will I'm going to finish the work he gave me to do now the work that God gave Jesus to do is different than the work God gave you to do but it should be your desire to do the will of God and finish the work that God has given you to do Jesus sets the example for us in that how about John 5 17 but Jesus answered them my father worketh hitherto and I work Jesus viewed his ministry as work he used the word that they would understand as work John 9 4 I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day the night comes when no man can work how about John 17 4 I have glorified thee on earth this is the high priestly prayer of our Lord Jesus Christ I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do when you get to the end of your life and unless Christ comes back and the rapture happens we're all gonna die some will die sooner than others but all of us are gonna die someday I mean we know that in the back of our minds but we don't often think about that are you ready to stand before the Lord Jesus Christ and say I finished the work that you gave me to do or how much time energy and resources have you squandered when you should have been finishing a work that you knew God wanted you to do none of us are gonna rank hundred percent on that I wonder how many of you are even gonna give above ten percent sometimes I wonder that about myself one of the things that gets me up out of bed early in the morning every morning God has set for me a goal for that day I have to finish the work that God gave me to do in that day are you ever motivated like that for me it's a joy I love the work that God has given me to do I really do I love the ministry I'm definitely not in it for the money I'm not in it for the power I'm not in it for the fame I'm not in it for the crowds of people that come as you can see I love the work though God has given me a love for the ministry Jesus himself set the example principle number two this is related to work that all we all of us have to do the work that we have done for Christ will be tested that's principle number two the work that we have done for Christ will be tested that includes whether we have actually worked to support ourselves and those whom God entrusted to our care as per the full four, fourfold division that I just gave you it's not just you know what kind of work did you do that's passing out tracks that word work encompasses every aspect of your life where you are engaged in something profitable that will bring glory to Christ which all those areas supporting your family for example is one of the areas where God gave you the issue of work your work is going to be tested and you're going to get a reward for it or not get a reward for it let's look at some passages how about first Corinthians chapter 3 verses 13 through 15 every man's work shall be made manifest in other words your score is going to go up on the big board and everybody's going to see it every works man's work shall be made manifest the day shall declare it for it shall be revealed by fire and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort 
it is. It can look really nice. It can look all gaudy. It can look all tacky, like some of the modern stuff that's supposed to be beautiful. But the fire will test it to see whether or not it's gold and silver and precious stone or wood, hay, and stubble. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, that is the foundation which is Jesus Christ, so the foundation can no man lay, and that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. You don't lose your salvation at the judgment seat of Christ. Salvation is eternal. I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. John chapter 10. Jesus speaking. How about over in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 17? And if you call on the Father, who without respect of persons judgeth according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. There's going to be a judgment of your works. And that includes your work. How about Revelation 22, 12? And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. If you've been a sloth all your life, you've been a mooch all your life, you know what? You're not going to get any rewards. Same word is used here. Principle number three. We are individually accountable for the work that we do, not for somebody else's work. We certainly won't get credit for somebody else's work, even though here on earth a lot of people get credit for work that other people do, like people who plagiarize and stuff like that. But we're going to be individually accountable for the work we do. Galatians chapter 6, verse 4. But let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. You are individually accountable. You're not part of a collective. You know, God's not going to judge you and say, well, which church were you part of? And boy, that church is a really good church, so I'm going to bless you because you were part of that church. You're individually accountable for the work that you do. Principle number four. The leadership gifts are not the only ones involved in ministry. It's really important. Everybody says, yeah, yeah, the pastor, you know, that's, that's his job. Did you know what? Part of the job of the pastor is to train you to do the work of the ministry. Did you know that? Ministry means service. It's divine service. But it specifically says so in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 12. We are responsible for repairing, that's the word that's used, every believer for the work of the ministry. There are three times the word for in English, F-O-R, are used in this verse. Listen for them. I'll read it in a second. But three times you find the word for. The first of those is the Greek word pros. I'm not going to give you a heavy Greek lesson tonight, but I want you to know the difference between these. The second two, two times, it's ace. Pros means toward or for the purpose of accomplishing. Ace means unto. Unto. Now here's the verse. For the perfecting of the saints, the leadership gifts, he's been talking about apostle, prophet, evangelist, and pastor, teacher. And what are they supposed to be do? They're for the perfecting, that is for the repairing is the word that's used there, of the saints... So that's pros, toward that goal of repairing the saints for, that's ace, unto the work of the ministry for ace, the edifying of the body of Christ. Or the build, building up, edifying means to build up. So the leadership gifts, one of my gifts as a pastor teacher, is to help repair you so that you can do the work of the ministry and so that you can edify the body of Christ. You can't sit on the sidelines. You have to be involved in spiritual ministry. That's not just the job of the pastor and sometimes the elders. It's the job of every believer. And part of my job is why I preach expositorily and why I go through passages with long details like this and don't just tell you warm, fuzzy things like Joel Osteen or somebody. It's because I'm trying to repair you so that you can do the work of the ministry so that you can edify the body of Christ. That's what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 12. Principle number 5. And we're almost done. Every man is to be involved actively in work. Every man is to actively be involved in work. 1 Thessalonians 4.11 That you study to be quiet, to do your own business, and to work with your own hands as we commanded you. It wasn't a suggestion. It wasn't an option. 
It's a command. Work with your own hands. Do your own business. Quit opening your mouth and just get to work. 2 Thessalonians 3.10 For even when we were with you, and this is verses 10, 11, and 12. We've got, we've got three verses here on this. For even when we were with you, we commanded you that if any would not work, neither should he eat. That's why we didn't give money to those guys who would come around and try to sponge off the church. We offered them work. And if any will not work, neither shall he eat. That's what it says. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly. That word disorderly is the word lazily. Some of you guys are lazy, working not at all, but are busybodies. You have a lot of time on your hands. You know, <laughs> speaking of time on your hands, I, I come driving into the church parking lot many times day and night because I've been out doing various things. And frequently I see parked right out here at the end of our driveway some people, and at night you can see the, the glare of their iPad or whatever they got, one of these little devices. It, it's shining up on their face. And, you know... At first, I thought, I wonder what this is. And so one day I walked out and I knocked on the guy's window and uh, said, excuse me, I'm Pastor Spencer. Are you looking for somebody here? And he grinned and he said, oh, no. He just said, I I'm playing Pokemon Go because uh, your gymnasium is one of the spots uh, on the Pokemon Go. And so I have to drive in here to find it. And I don't know what they do. I don't know how to play that game. Uh, I don't play games on the Internet. But he says, you know, I, I, I drive in here, I see that. And then the next place I have to do is I have to sit here at the end of the driveway and do whatever else. I mean, I have seen so many dozen, and not just, you know, teenage types. I mean, guys who are dressed in businessmen's suits, like at lunch hour, they're playing Pokemon Go at their lunch break. I've seen older women sitting out here playing Pokemon Go at the end of our driveway. I mean, they have nothing else to do with their time. Paul talks about that. We hear there are some which walk among you lazily, work disorderly, working not at all, but are busy bodies. That's what replaces the work. They stick their nose into all kinds of other things. Now to them that are such, we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, this isn't Paul's you know, personal pet peeve. This is a command from Christ given through the Apostle Paul and inspired in the New Testament that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. Quit mooching off the church. 1 Corinthians 4.12 And labor, Paul speaking of himself, working with our own hands, being reviled we bless, we, being persecuted we suffer it. We know what Paul did. He was a tent maker. That's what he did with Aquila and Priscilla. It tells us so in the book of Acts. The verse we read out of 1 Corinthians 9 a minute ago, or I only and Barnabas have we not power to forbear working. Yeah, he had the authority to do it because of his spiritual gifts. How about Ephesians 4.28? Here's a great contrast. You know, the Old Testament gives what we call the Ten Commandments. You know, nine of those are restated in the New Testament. The one about the Sabbath is not restated. But the other nine are restated in the New Testament. But in the Old Testament, the law said, don't do this because if you do, you get smacked. I mean, that was the basic rule, you know. Obey the law or you get smacked. In the New Testament, you not only have these things restated, but you have them enhanced with additional obligations, which you could not do under the law, but by the power of the Spirit of God, who dwells in you as a believer, you're able to do it. Listen to the business about work, what it says here. This is Ephesians 4.28. Let him that stole steal no more. Now that's the Old Testament law. Thou shalt not steal. Okay? But Paul doesn't just leave it there. You know, why is the guy stealing? He says he wants something. You know what God ordained for how to get that something? Instead of stealing it, you work and buy it. And so Paul adds, he says, let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands, the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needed. Now that's a lot more enhanced than you ever have in the Old Testament in the Decalogue in Exodus 20 or Deuteronomy chapter 5 where the Ten Commandments are stated the second time. He says, you got to work with your own hands. But it doesn't stop there. He says, there's a reason for that. And you have to work the thing that is good. In other words, you can't go out and be a striptease dancer. You have to work the thing that is good. You have to have a morally righteous job not a wicked job. 
And you know the purpose for that? It's not so that you can get rich. What does it say at the end of that? That he may have to give to him that needeth. Folks, that's an enhancement of the law that they never had placed on them in the Old Testament. Paul says, now that you're a believer, now that you have the indwelling Holy Spirit, now that you understand the grace of God, now that you've been a recipient of grace, now you become a conduit for grace. And finally, number six, the type of work God expects, especially married women, to do is also mentioned in 1 Timothy 5.10. A widow who's going to be taken care of by the church. Before the church takes care of that widow, first of all, she has specific relatives who are uh, assigned to take care of her, but if she doesn't have any of that, she also has to have met certain qualifications. Well reported of for good works. If she have brought up children, if she have lodged strangers, if she have washed the saints' feet, if she have relieved the afflicted, if she have diligently followed every good work. And he says the younger widows refuse because, you know, they'll become busybodies wandering from house to house, speaking things which they ought not. He says, I will that the younger widows get married, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. Work. Second way that God says we're supposed to, pro to provide for our needs, sometimes you don't have the money. Sometimes because of a situation in which God has graciously allowed you to be, he gives opportunity to other believers to meet your need. But generally the principle is, labor with your hands the thing that is good, that you may have to give to him that needeth. Our gracious Heavenly Father, once again we thank you for your word and for its power. We've really had to run through this section very, very quickly. But we pray, Father, that you will teach us that the way of the charlatan, the way of Simon Magus the magician, the ways of all the apostates that Peter mentions, that Paul mentions at different locations, all the different ones we came across in the book of Acts. That's not your way. Your way builds the body of Christ. It doesn't steal from the body of Christ. It gives to the body of Christ. And Father, we pray that you might help us to be the kind of people that reflect the character of our Lord Jesus Christ who loved us and gave himself for us. Father, we commit these things to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn for tonight.